Yeah, thank you. So this is an example of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, but Eric asked me to give Jean Yves' talk, and I've spoken to Jean Yves. So these are his slides. Um, there was a terrible jam on the proofreek, as they say, in Paris, and um, uh, he didn't, unfortunately missed his flight by only a few minutes. But anyway, there was that, that's uh, he'll be here later in the meeting. So I'm using his slides uh, largely, but um, let's see how we go. Uh, Johnny was asked to give a strategy of uh, about GIST in 2015, how things have changed, and I'll try and give you a sense of that from this uh, discussion. Uh, so firstly, just to remind everyone that uh, GIST, or gastrointestinal stromal tumour, arises from precursor cells of the interstitial cells of Cajal. These are the cells that are responsible for peristalsis in the gut. Um, they type with CD117, or the KIT pro oncoprotein, uh, but also can type with uh, CD34, and um, sometimes, uh, and a very useful marker is a marker called DOG1. DOG stands for discovered on GIST. Um, these tumours are resistant to cytotoxic agents and indeed said to be resistant to radiotherapy other than for palliative reasons. And uh, the hallmark of this disease is the presence of activating KIT and platelet-derived growth factor receptor mutations in both sporadic GIST that we see mostly, but also in familial forms of GIST. Uh, here's, an, here's just the uh, cartoon, I, I guess, that illustrates the various mutations that are seen. Uh, you can see on the left the exon, uh, the KIT mutations, of which exon 11 are the commonest mutations, but exon 9 are important from a, a treatment perspective, and both of these are relatively sensitive, more so in the case of exon 11 to imatinib. And in, in, with respect to PDGF receptor alpha, uh, you can see that the uh, common mutation there is the exon 18 mutation, um, which are relatively uh, resistant to uh, imatinib, as you'll see later on. It's worth remembering that these somehow um, these mutations somehow uh, relate to the location of the tumour, so these tumours can occur anywhere in the GI tract, although the commonest is the stomach. In, in the stomach, uh, you most often see exon 11 uh, tumours with an exon 11 mutation. Uh, in the jejunum and small bowel, exon 9, uh, PDGF receptor alpha, exon 18 are more common in the stomach as well, and wild type can occur anywhere. But none of these are absolute, and so if you really, um, so whilst the location has some impact here, it's a relative uh, um, idea of what's happening rather than an absolute um, change. Just to remind you that when the uh, pivotal studies were done, so on the left-hand graph that you can see there, um, the yellow and pink lines are the two doses of imatinib, 400 and 800 milligrams in terms of uh, overall, uh, in terms of PFS, and there was a small benefit, but not a significant benefit in terms of survival to um, the, high, the higher dose, so essentially they're virtually equivalent. Whereas when you look at the Exxon 9 group, there clearly is a difference in um, uh, in, the, in patients receiving a higher dose, so in the green as opposed to the blue, uh, there's a, a, quite a big difference in, in PFS in favour of the higher dose of imatinib. And this really led to, there's not going to be any other data in the setting, and so in, in fact now for patients with an exon 9 mutation with metastatic disease tend to have, um, uh, be treated with a higher dose of imatinib. And this has implications in adjuvant therapy as well, we'll go through some of these shortly. So in terms of localised GIST, there are lots of questions. Uh, what, what sort of treatments do we give? How long do we treat patients for? Uh, who do we treat and who don't we treat? What's the impact of various mutations on treatment? What do we do after the uh, adjuvant therapy stops? And, uh, and, and, in, in, and in fact, what do we do when people relapse? Here are the three major phase three studies that have been done in the adjuvant setting. The ACASOG study was done in North America by the American College, Surgical Oncology Group, that's called Z9001. The Scandinavian and German cooperative groups uh, c conducted a study of 12 versus 36 months. The American study, the ACASOG study, was 0 versus 12 months. And the EORTC, and, uh, which the Australian group participated, was no treatment as adjuvant after surgery or versus two years of treatment. And these trials are all a little bit different, and they're telling us somewhat different things, I guess. The, uh, the, both in terms of the ACASOG study and the Scandinavian study, recurrence-free survival was the primary endpoint. 
the EORTC study that I described initially started off with overall survival as the endpoint, and when we realized that most of the investigators would have retired by the time we reached enough uh, endpoints for survival, we changed it to a matinib failure-free survival. Um, the important thing is the Akasog study with tumors greater than three centimeters at resection, the Scandinavian and German studies were high-risk tumors as defined in this slide, and the EORTC study was intermediate or high-risk. And as you can see in the adjuvant study, um, this is uh, recurrence-free survival, and, and uh, I think this is the pointer. So you can see that in the, um, in the treatment group, um, there's initially uh, patients are stable and then uh, start to fall off around the 18-month point. Uh, people start to relapse immediately um, in the control group. Uh, that is, remember, this is 12 months versus no treatment following surgery. Um, and, but, and in fact, in the updated analysis that was uh, published last year, the same data was seen. And because people were relapsing in both arms at the two-year to three-year mark, the thinking was that this is too short of time of adjuvant therapy. Nevertheless, the benefit was seen in terms of recurrence-free survival in uh, all groups, but particularly the group uh, in this bottom panel, the group with the very large tumors. In terms of overall survival, though, after one year of treatment, people would, might, would relapse on the, on the control arm and receiving no therapy and would be salvaged so that there was no difference in overall survival. In the Scandinavian study, uh, this was, remember, three years of adjuvant imatinib versus one year for high-risk patients. Um, and you can see here that there's a clear difference in terms of recurrence-free survival, the primary endpoint, um, and you can see the data here with the hazard ratio of 0.46, which is highly significant. Um, this was updated at ASCO uh, this year, and you can see the data continue with, again, a hazard ratio of 0.6, p-value, again, highly significant benefit in terms of recurrence-free survival. Uh, this benefit was seen in all subgroups. Um, this is the original data presentation as well as all the various uh, mutation subtypes. But this was the thing that, confused, uh, that, that uh, really astounded most people in the field because what we expected to see happen is that when patients relapsed on the one-year arm, the, the patients that had one year of treatment, they should have been salvaged by the uh, imatinib and you would have expected no difference in overall survival. And yet here, in terms of the overall survival curves, you can see there is a clear difference, again, a hazard ratio of 0.45 that was significant. And this was updated once again at ASCO this year, and you can see the same survival benefit continues. Exactly why this is the case is not clear, but, it, but clearly three years of imatinib as an adjuvant has become the standard treatment for people with high-risk GIST following surgery. The uh, EORTC study, of which there are a number of other cooperative groups, including the Australian group involved, uh, has um, reported last year at ASCO, but the manuscript is submitted. You can see again um, in the high-risk group, there is a big difference on the left curve here, uh, a big difference for the two years of treatment versus no treatment. That's not surprising. Patients with uh, high-risk tumors are going to relapse, and there's going to be a difference in relapse-free survival. In terms of this intermediate endpoint of imatinib failure-free survival, that's not significant between the two curves. Um, certainly there's a, a trend, if you like, that um, patients uh, receiving imatinib are better off, but it remains to be seen whether that translates into a survival benefit. So when you look at the prognostic uh, um, classification um, for, for GIST, there's been, we've looked at size, we've looked at mitotic figures, we've looked at tumor site, uh, we've looked at tumor rupture, and the question that's always been on everyone's mind is what's the role of um, mutation analysis? Is there any point in doing it, and does it, uh, does it help in terms of prognosis? And here's a study that was performed by the Spanish group reported at ESMO last year. It was a registry study, so this was a, a over, th over 390 patients that were collected in a registry. They did not receive adjuvant imatinib, and if you classify them according to the Matinin criteria, you end up with uh, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk, and as you can see, the curves uh, nicely separate as, uh, separate as you would expect. 
But if you look at the actual mutations, so these are um, patients were carefully typed, and you look at the evidence, uh, look for mutation changes, and these are deleted, the 557 or, or 558 codons deleted in exon 11 is probably the commonest deletion you see in the exon 11 group. And as you can see, where that deletion occurs, uh, people actually had a much worse outcome. So prognostically, this deletion appears to be important. And so if you go back and look at this registry now and type patients into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk, what you can see is in the, if you take the intermediate risk group, if you start to now break the intermediate risk, which is just based on size, location, and mitotic count, into mutation type, you can see that you get a group there in red. Uh, you, get, uh, you get a group here which have actually got a much worse outcome. And that's led, this is a... Um, a slide that I couldn't read on my laptop, so I'm not sure you're going to be able to see it too well, but uh, what, what on the left algorithm is, a, on the left side is an algorithm around how you uh, might treat these patients, and um, if you can bear with me, this is gastric uh, gist, this is non-gastric, and in the gastric gist, there's a subgroup here, so that's the commonest group, a subgroup here with intermediate risk, with an a, um, a adverse mutation change, that might lead you to using adjuvant and matinib as opposed to observing those patients. So it looks like that as we head to 2015, as we leave 2015, or we're almost uh, through the first, we are through the first half, it looks like that the things that are going to determine prognosis are size, mitotic rate, site, rupture, and mutation analysis. What do we do when patients complete their three years of treatment? And this is a study that's ongoing. It's only got a small number of patients on it. So patients that have had three years of treatment of adjuvant imatinib, they're at high risk. And the study, in the original study that I showed you, treatment stopped. And in this case now, they are being randomized to stopping as, they, as is the standard of care versus continuing for another three years of imatinib. And we'll have to see what happens uh, with time as these... Uh, as these data uh, develop. In terms of metastatic disease, I guess one of the important things to mention, and those of us that treat GIST really know this, when we first started uh, treating patients with GIST in 2000, 2001, there were a whole lot of prevalent patients, a number of patients who, with advanced disease, and the recruitment of the study was phenomenal. Um, and, uh, but these patients often had very advanced disease, and I, I, I had a session this morning when I described um, one of the, the third patient entered onto our study uh, was actually admitted to intensive care to receive oral therapy. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that patient met the criteria of uh, ECOG 0 to 2. Nevertheless, they ended up in intensive care. They did walk out of intensive care. But now things have changed, and we are now seeing incident cases, and patients are being picked up a lot earlier. And so in the, as you can see here in the, um, in the red is the, uh, the phase three study. That's the early study I described, median PFS of 20 months. Um, in a, a subsequent study cited by the French group, median PFS of nearly 30 months. This is not about better treatment. This is the same treatment, but really reflecting the change in uh, natural history and um, perhaps the, 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 um, the fact that we are picking these patients up a lot earlier. And just to illustrate, this is long-term overall survival. So uh, this left arrow uh, here, uh, this left-hand arrow, so this is the median overall survival um, in 18 months. That's the historical data. That's what we think is uh, untreated people with metastatic gist. Here's 58 months in the um, B2222 study, which is one of the early phase two studies done in the US. And here's the BFR14 started later and improving the median overall survival, which is due to, I think, picking up patients earlier and starting treatment earlier. Um, again, exon 11 muta or mutation status makes a difference here. And without going into this in great detail, here's the one-year PFS, for example, or if you like, three-year PFS. And there does appear to be differences between the exon 11 and exon 9 group. And it's generally recognized that the exon 9 group have a worse prognosis. But if you start to look at even within the Exxon 11 group, and before we talked about the, delete, the deleted 557 or 558 codons and there in Exxon 11, although they were a negative prognostic factor, they appear to be a positive predictive factor, and these patients do better with imatinib. Um, with respect to PDG, PDGFR receptor alpha, just in the advanced phase, um, you can see that the D842V, which is the commonest mutation in exon 18, uh, in exon 18 
uh, do poorly um, with imatinib, and in fact they do just as badly with imatinib uh, or sunitinib, as you can see in this slide here. So this is uh, progression, this is overall survival, this is progression-free survival, and the group with the D842V don't do well um, um, when, when they receive imatinib. And I'll show you there are some trials going on for this group in, in a moment. And another important message that we've learnt, and the, uh, this, this is here uh, for partly historical reasons, but to tell you about the update. So a very interesting French study where patients are randomised uh, to, sorry, patients were receiving imatinib 400 milligrams a day, and then they were randomised at one year to continue imatinib or stop. They randomised at uh, the people that continued at three years, they were randomised to continue imatinib or stop. The people randomised, uh, the people on treatment still at five years of treatment were randomised to continue imatinib or stop. And just, and the French group, Jean-Yves tell me, is about to open the 10-year time point. I'm not sure that, what the numbers are like, but it's a very interesting study. And what the studies tell us is that you can't stop imatinib therapy. That patients, if you stop the treatment, even after, certainly after five years, we don't know about 10, but if you stop the treatment, patients relapse and they're not all salvageable by, um, con by resuming treatment. What about the role of surgery in advanced disease? And this is, uh, if you like, adjuvant surgery. Um, we treat people with advanced disease with imatinib, as you've heard. Um, and there's been a question asked about the role of surgery and debulking in this condition. Um, certainly within the worldwide uh, community, we tried to start a study through ERTC, which unfortunately failed. But a study was done in China, it has a small number of um, patients, but nevertheless did, uh, did, does give us a suggestion that there may be a role for, for additional surgery. So patients, small number of patients, only 41 patients in total, and uh, as you can see they're randomised to receive imatinib alone or surgery plus imatinib, surgery as in debulking, and very small numbers, but there does appear to be a benefit to the surgery arm. So in terms of um, what about other drugs that uh, are, are useful in this disease, here are the kinome maps with the size of the bubble representing affinity. You can see imatinib on the left and sunitinib, and uh, uh, clearly that uh, they're, they're, these are different molecules. Um, and uh, you can see that it, sunitinib in these curves on the left, if you can read that properly, is that patients receiving sunitinib who have an exon 9 mutation do better with that drug than patients with an exon 11 mutation both in terms of um, overall survival, progression-free survival, and response rate. When you look for secondary mutations, and this is mostly done in a research setting, there are secondary mutations that occur commonly. They occur within tumours. They occur between tumours within the same patient and makes this setting a, a complicated setting, but it means we've got to look for drugs that inhibit these other targets. And one of the important drugs that's uh, become available um, in the last couple of years is regorafenib. This, uh, you can see again the kino map. It's different uh, to sunitinib and imatinib. It inhibits a number of uh, uh, key targets in this disease. And uh, following some preclinical data and a very nice phase two data done in, out of Boston, a randomized phase three trial was commenced. It's called the GRID study. And this study randomized patients to regorafenib plus best supportive care versus placebo plus best supportive care. And at the time of progression, there was the opportunity to uh, put patients on the control arm uh, into, uh, to receive regorafenib. And here are the results of progression-free survival. You can see a very significant difference in the two curves with the yellow curve on top being the patients that receive regorafenib. The hazard ratio here is 0.27 and it's highly significant. When you look at overall survival though, the curves come together. Again, this is what you'd expect when patients cross over to an effective drug. Um, if you, there are a whole range of different drugs that have been used in this disease, um, and you can see the list here. Um, so a number of drugs that have been explored and continue to be explored. Uh, this year at, at uh, ASCO, just a few weeks ago, Jean-Yves Blay, um, your speaker, virtual speaker, if you like, uh, presented these data. This is the PASA-GIST trial. Um, so this is for patients who have failed imatinib and failed sunitinib. And uh, this is, uh, so they received 800 milligram of pazapinib plus best supportive care or best supportive care alone in patients that have failed both imatinib and sunitinib. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And you can see there was a difference. Uh, the hazard ratio here is 0.59. It was statistically significant. So there continues to be developments, no difference in overall survival as you would expect. 
So there continue to be development of these small molecules that uh, do have a role and just working out exactly where they all fit is the challenge for all of us. Interestingly, in this particular study, patients that had not had a prior gastrectomy had a much better outcome, suggesting that this had an impact on PK levels, at least as, at a simplistic level, uh, remains to be proven. Finally, a study presented at ASCO last year called the Wright Study, and this study was basically again for patients who had progressed on imatinib and sunitinib, and as clinicians, we'd often wonder whether we should keep um, as some sort of uh, in inhibition of kit, um, pre, you know, continue imatinib in these patients. Um, it, it was something we wanted to do, but where regulators were involved or um, reimbursement agencies, it was always forbidden. This study really proves, if you like, that if you continue uh, to put these cells under the pressure of a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that targets kit, uh, you do see a benefit in progression-free survival um, and not overall survival. Uh, because of the crossover. So um, in this case, so just to illustrate, there are a number of drugs being explored for other conditions like the D842V mutant GIST. These patients don't tend to uh, recur after a surgery, but when they do recur, I showed you they've got a worse outcome. And there are trials um, for exploring drugs uh, with, these, um, uh, with these various subtypes. Again, BRAF V600E is one of the subtypes we see in wild type GIST. Uh, and it's not very common, um, but again, the opportunity to explore some of the targeted drugs that are available for these mutations. There are a number of studies ongoing. I won't go through them all in particular, but just to show you one is how do we bring some of these drugs that are effective in second and third line that are salvaging patients, how do we bring them forward? At the end of the day, we want to try and get better control in the first line setting. And at least one idea is that you compare imatinib against some molecular subtype, or indeed you start to bring these up in some sort of sequence. And with that in, in mind, the uh, Australian group has started a study with uh, Heike Joensu as the principal investigator. So it's a, it's a cooperative group, uh, intergroup study, where patients with metastatic gist are given first line imatinib or alternatively imatinib alternating with regorafenib, which I showed you was a very effective drug in the third line setting. So in conclusion, um, um, Monsieur's Chair, the, uh, um, this um, GIST is a complex disease with really multiple subtypes. Um, we think that increasingly molecular subtyping will be important in the decision making analysis around adjuvant therapy. Uh, we do have to modify our treatment in advanced disease according to disease subtype. There are many novel agents being explored in this condition, including, if you like, if we call it a novel agent, the role of surgery in advanced disease. Uh, and uh, we continue to explore this disease, and I thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I didn't have the very uh, charming French accent of Jean-Yves Blais. You've had to put up with an Australian. Thank you. <laughs>